back. There's going to be a lot of uh, barriers, and just keep swimming. I love that. You've been in the writing world for a long time. How did that start? What caused you to be interested in writing? You know, I think initially it came because I grew up in a reading household, mm-hmm. and so everybody had books at night. So after dinner, we would just sit literally in the library. It was the 70s, and so it was a paperback library with all those pulp fiction sci-fi books right. just yes. <laughs> covering the walls. Uh, you know, your Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, Tanith Lee, a lot of that great stuff. And so uh, I was immediately saw value in story. And for Mm -hmm. myself, I was really interested in Greek mythology, which is sort of that ancient three-act structure of story, and and I just fell into it. Was there a key event, moment, uh, that led led to you first getting published? You know, uh, I got rejected over 423 times before I found my first agent. But you kept swimming. I just kept (laughs) swimming, which might look like denial. <laughs> and and but I just kept swimming, and so uh, my first, my, actually my very first book was my that I wrote was my master's thesis, and it was like many first books, semi autobiographical. Um, it was pretty awful. It had you know those fifty pound dialogue tags, like <laughs> why doesn't my father love me? Hannah said, rubbing her chocolate brown <laughs> eyes pitifully so it had that sort of stuff Uh, I got rejected 25 times on that one Mm -hmm. and it stung I didn't know any better it stung and so I took it as criticism of me rather than of my writing and it was my writing I wasn't there yet yeah and then um and then and this is I talk about this somewhat in my TEDx talk a few years a few years later uh, my husband committed suicide it was Mm -hmm. it was 9-11 I was pregnant at the time and I, um, I had so much negativity in me, and I couldn't get it out fast enough with my therapist, so I started writing. And of all things, I wrote a humorous mystery. And looking back, it makes sense. I wanted coherence to the story. I wanted right. justice. I wanted, I wanted a happy ending, and I wasn't going to get right. it anywhere else. So I wrote that novel, and I think that's why I got that one published, because it had truth in it. It had my human sure. truth in it. And it still got rejected over 423 times <laughs> till I got an agent, because just uh, keep swimming, you guys. Just keep swimming. But mysteries always have a sense of closure. There's resolution. Exactly. Whatever bad stuff has happened before... It gets worked out at the end, right? Absolutely. It's very soothing, and I think that's why they're always on the New York Times bestseller list. We crave that that closure that we don't usually get in everyday life. I think you're right. So was that the first Murder by Month book? That was. That was May Day. That was the first, that was the first Murder by Month book. And I, I actually just got the rights back in May to the first 10. And so now I'm calling them the Mira James Mysteries. Nice. Yeah, and giving them whole new covers and trying to figure out this marketing stuff. Now, that's something I'm interested in, and I think other people will be as well. You got the rights back from the original publisher, right? Yes, from what the original. What was that like? How did you ever pull that off? You know what? It was a, um, I played the long game is what I did. So I had 10 books with this, actually 11 books with the same publisher. And when the first one came out, it was 2006, and that was before ebooks were really, um, right. r- really a, a contender in the market. And so my... My right reversion language was very vague, and it allowed them to have the books forever because I didn't think ebooks were going to be a thing. My agent didn't think ebooks were going to be a thing. And so when they wanted the 11th in that series, I said I would write it if they would update all my contract language Mm -hmm. to mean if I sold fewer than 300 copies in two consecutive royalty periods, I would get the rights back. And I knew that had been the case for a while, and I knew they weren't really tracking it very closely, and so they gave me that um, and and took a little money off my advance for it. That was the trade-off. I was fine with that, and uh, it meant I got my rights back to 10 books. That's brilliant. My first decade or so of books, I eventually managed to recover the ebook rights yeah. based on the minor technicality that ebooks aren't even mentioned in any oh, of those no. contracts because they didn't exist. <laughs> right? But I still haven't been able to get the audiobook rights, although those books, which were originally recorded on cassette tapes, oh my gosh. that doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> but the books themselves are in print. 
So uh, the publisher doesn't want to part with the audio books. Yeah. And that's been a struggle. It is a struggle because I find they also, in those many cases, don't want to promote them and don't what? want to do the work to update them, but they just sort of sit in that purgatory. Yeah, and so and so what I and I what I did is I just decided if you want something else, or I offered them something else that I knew they wanted in exchange for that. Now we've talked about the mystery books, but you've written way more than that, right? You've done sword and sorcery books. Yeah, I've got a terrible. It's actually a really good book with a terrible cover that I wrote with an ex boyfriend. He was a really <laughs> terrible boyfriend now, that's with a, a good right cover. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Actually, I paid him 50 bucks for it after we broke up. And the loser took the money, even though I did most of the writing. I figured he would say no. You Best did most $50 of it. you ever spent. Yeah, you're right. Is that in print now, then? It's, you know what? It, I, so it's written under Albert Lee, and it's okay. a novella available only as a Kindle. Um, but I also write so, Mad. Yes. Yeah, you it is. You can get it. You can get it if you want it. <laughs> And you've done YA, Young Adult Adventure Book, yeah, or books. Yeah, well, I, I can see the confusion because it's called the Toad House Trilogy, book right. one, but there's only one of them. Uh. It, and it came out in 2012, and uh, I'm super proud of that book, actually. It's about uh, two kids, loosely based on my children, an older sister and a younger brother who's blind, and they realize... <clears throat> excuse me, in the first couple chapters that they're living inside of Tom Sawyer, the book, and they have to move throughout books to basically save stories. And we got pretty close with publishers. My agent got pretty close, but they said no kid's going to be interested in a book about the classics. And mm-hmm. so I self-published it, um, and it's done okay, uh, but I just haven't gotten back to written the other two yet. Well, I understand why other things might take priority but i think that sounds brilliant i love this book i love the book <laughs> I want you to finish that yeah thank you and what else is on your resume magic realism i've got magical realism we yeah. talking gabriel garcia marquez pretty, here or? pretty similar to that yeah it's a story about uh, a group of women who and if you're not familiar with magical realism it's not like harry potter magic which right. i love it's more it's more of your everyday life but the frames a little bit wider so you see that magic that connects us whether it's cooking or conversation uh, or shared secrets and so it's about uh, a family of witches who are cursed by a man throughout um, throughout generations and they have to overcome that curse uh, and it's about basically secrets and, and what what we give up when we choose to keep a secret and I also see on your resume feminist thrillers oh, I love my feminist thrillers thank you for asking uh, I have one coming out next week it's Mercy's Chase uh, the first the first in the series Salem Cipher uh, came out uh, in 2016, and it came out shortly before the election, and it was about uh, assassination attempt on the first viable female presidential candidate in the mm-hmm. United States. But really what it is is uh, search through history and to the future to find clues that famous women have left uh, leading to a larger female secret. That's all I can tell you without giving it away. It's basically Da Vinci Code with more complex female characters. Well... That sounds good to me. Thank you. And uh, that book will be in print by the time this podcast airs, so everybody everybody needs to go get that. I bet a lot of people listening to this podcast are thinking, wait, I thought you had to write in one genre, or if you got to change your name if you're going to write something different. How are you dealing with that? That is the common wisdom that you that readers won't follow you um, unless you're famous. Of course, J.K. Rowling writes mystery and young adult. Neil Gaiman writes. But she across. used a different name. She right? used a different name. That is a good point. I, you know, I was having lunch with Dana Kay, who's a publicist out of Chicago, and she specializes in branding. And this was two years ago, so I'd already written across five genres by then. And I thought it was a hopeless case. And I, and I was talking to her, and I said, Dana, I can't ever brand myself, so I've just given up on it. And she said, of course you can brand yourself. She said, genre isn't where they put your book in the bookstore, and of course it is, but when you're branding yourself, think about your theme, what is absolutely every book you write about? And it, th- my answer was immediate. It's about secrets. Whether it's a mystery or a thriller, I grew up in a family with a lot of secrets, and that's my life theme is bringing them into the light, and that's my fiction and nonfiction theme, bringing them into the light. So I rewrote my my bio. Uh, I 
remastered all of my promotional materials, and it's Jess Lowry writes about secrets. Everything else is just a vehicle for that. That's fairly brilliant. Yeah, Dana's amazing, yeah. How are you dealing with the, it sometimes seems anyway, tumultuous changes going on in the publishing world right now? Yeah, you know, and it does seem tumultuous. I think, and this is this is solid advice I'd give to any writer, to be a hybrid writer, do some traditional publishing and start there, but also do some indie publishing. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling out the terrain of exactly how that looks, and I've spent this summer learning marketing, or starting to learn marketing, and I've had my first profitable summer. I had one good year where I made a profit off my books in 2007. Otherwise, since then, I've been about breaking even, honestly. Uh, this summer, my profit so far was $8,000, which isn't huge, but it was over two months, and um, I think I can find a way to make it sustainable. But hybrid, it's like diversifying your stocks, right? right. You don't put them all in one spot. You, 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 you diversify. That makes it, you know, sometimes people take the nose in the air approach to writing and literature and criticize people for trying new things. And this is the only realm, it seems to me, where that exists. Everywhere (laughs) else in America, we praise entrepreneurs and innovators, except not sometimes in writing. Well, and I think, I absolutely agree, and I think sometimes it's because there's this area of writing that I call snap publishing, which is a little different than self-publishing. Snap publishing is basically where you write a book and snap, you put it out there without the editing or the cover design. Yikes. Right. And and I think a lot of people do that. And and that's that's not the best way to go, right? Because that book's out there forever and any book needs editing. But if, if you take away that snap publishing element, there's some phenomenal fiction and nonfiction being indie pubbed right now. It's really good stuff. It's some of the best stuff. And I agree. Thank you for being with me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Wasn't she terrific? I'm going to have Jess back for a later podcast to talk about her nonfiction book, Rewrite Your Life. In the meantime, writers, remember, I've got eight books in the Red Sneaker Writer series, and I'm working on the ninth. You can join our Facebook group for Red Sneaker Writers. There's a Twitter stream. Follow either hashtag Red Sneaker Writers or hashtag W Bernhardt. And you'll get everything you need to know about me and what the Red Sneaker Writer Center is doing. If you liked this podcast, please subscribe, rate it, comment on it, share it with your friends, or share it on social media. Get the word out. I would really appreciate it. Next time, since it'll be October, the spooky month, I'm going to have an interview with two, two of my favorite mystery writers, Will and Julia Thomas. Till then, keep writing. Remember, you cannot fail if you don't quit. See you next time.